His career as a diplomat spanned nearly 50 years, during which time he earned nicknames like Raging Bull and Bulldozer, both because he was notoriously forceful when it came to negotiations. No, no, there's been no breakthrough. We're just working hard. Richard Holbrook worked tirelessly for the U.S. government from the conflict in Vietnam to the war in Afghanistan. He also served as the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. But his biggest achievement as a diplomat came in the form of the 1995 peace plan in Bosnia. He was its architect. On paper, we have peace. To make it work is our next and our greatest challenge. Mr. Holbrook passed away at the age of 69. He was taken to hospital last Friday after falling ill during a meeting with Hillary Clinton, his boss. Ambassador Richard Holbrook has been a giant of the diplomatic corps for almost 50 years. He is practically synonymous with American foreign policy of that time period. Hours before Richard Holbrook died, President Obama also had nothing but good things to say about him. He is simply uh, one of the giants of American foreign policy. And as anyone who's ever worked with him knows, uh, or uh, had uh, the clear disadvantage of negotiating across the table from him, uh, Richard is relentless. He never stops. He never quits because he's always believed that if we stay focused, if we act on our mutual interests, that progress is possible. Richard Holbrook has spent the last couple of years as the U.S. Special Envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Having served in both Vietnam and Afghanistan, he rejected direct comparisons between the two wars, but he has acknowledged similarities and suggested Afghanistan would become the longest conflict in U.S. history. had the op opportunity to receive some of you, the newest ambassadors to the United States in the Oval Office. Uh, but I wanted to be here today for two reasons. First, I want to thank our extraordinary State Department employees for the tireless work that you do. Uh, you are the backbone of American foreign policy, especially those of you who are serving far away from home uh, on the ho uh, during the holidays. Day in, day out. You strengthen our alliances, you forge new partnerships, you prevent conflicts and the spread of deadly weapons, you promote global prosperity and global health, you stand up for human rights, and you stand up for universal values. In other words, you, you show the world uh, the very best of America. Uh, and on behalf of the American people, I want to say thank you. You are doing an extraordinary job. Now, the other reason I want to be here was to say uh, how much the United States values the partnerships and friendships uh, of the nations that are represented here. As you know, my administration has pursued a new era of engagement around the world, an engagement that's grounded in mutual interest and mutual respect. It depends on trust. It depends on candor. That's the essence of our diplomacy and the essence of our partnerships. And our commitment to dim diplomacy, to building partnerships of mutual interest and mutual respect, is going to remain uh, a fundamental cornerstone of our foreign policy. It will not change uh, because not only is it right for America, but it's right for the world. And let me say that our engagement includes building partnerships between our peoples. Now, that's what Michelle and I uh, worked to do during our recent visit to India, for example, uh, which occurred during Diwali. As many of you have seen, uh, during a Diwali celebration with some of the school children, uh, Michelle joined in the dancing. So did I. Uh, the difference was she was good. Uh, the headlines were you know, a little bruising to my ego. They said, uh, President Obama visits India. Michelle Obama rocks India. 
It was just one small example, uh, but it spoke to a larger truth, uh, one that's at the heart of this holiday season. When we reach out to one another, when we see beyond the differences that supposedly divide us, when we come together, uh, even if it's for some dance, or some song, or a shared story, uh, a shared memory, uh, we're reminded that uh, fundamentally we are the same. There is a commonality between us. There is an essential human experience that we all share. And it gets lost in politics, and it gets lost in rivalries, and there are barriers of ethnicity and religion and language. Uh, and yet, scratch the surface, take the time to get to know somebody else uh, from a different culture, a different race, a different ethnicity, and it turns out uh, that there are hopes and dreams that bind us together. And our jobs, both as political leaders and as diplomats, uh, is to make sure that those bonds are strengthened and broadened, uh, that they penetrate uh, into our respective nations, uh, that uh, each of us is able to stand in the other person's shoes and see through the other person's eyes, uh, that people are no longer simply the other or simply foreigners, but are in fact our, our brothers and sisters. And uh, if we're insistent enough uh, about the capacity to understand each other, then that translates concretely into some war that doesn't happen, some village that uh, isn't destroyed, some child that get something to eat, uh, some disaster that is averted. Um, that's what all of you do. That's your essential task. Uh, and you do it very, very well. Uh, and so to Secretary Clinton, to the State Department, uh, thank you for doing so much extraordinary work over the past year, much of it to little notice and little acclaim, uh, I know what you do. Uh, and I know how important you are. Uh, and to the diplomats and dignitaries uh, from our friends and partners around the world, uh, let me say to you uh, that uh, we are absolutely confident that in the new year uh, we will have more opportunities to work together uh, and that if we stay focused on our task, uh, then uh, the world's going to be a better place for our children and our grandchildren. So Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, everybody. God bless you. Why are we in Afghanistan? The British Army has been fighting wars in Afghanistan since 1839. The Khyber Pass has been littered with British skeletons. In 329 BC, Alexander the Great crossed the Oxus River into Afghanistan. He was attacked by guerrillas and they stopped his advance towards China. Ghazni, between Kandahar and Kabul, was the center of a great Islamic empire famed for its music, architecture, science, and literature. Kandahar and Kabul were once Greek cities called 
Alexandria, surrounded by orchards and flower gardens. All this was to change in 1839 when the British decided that the Amir Doss Mohammed was too pro-Russian and posed a threat to British India. The British demolished city walls, stole the doors of the Islamic tomb at Ghazni to the tears of the custodians. The British army of the Indus reached Kandahar. They drove out 6,000 inhabitants and strapped tribal chiefs to field guns to impose order. They were pelted with stones and ran out of food and supplies. The starving British army of 16,500 were forced to retreat from Kabul in the snow. Deprived of their bribes, the Afghans, who are expert guerrilla fighters, fired down the British forces from the mountains. The officers panic and ride their horses over the sepoy infantry. All the 16,500 British army were cut down in the snow, save for one man. In a punishment raid, the British fought their way back to Kabul and blew up the bazaar at 2,000 shots. The British complained to the Amir about Russian advances into northern Afghanistan. The Amir refused to reply. The British envoy and 75 staff were murdered. As a reprisal, General Roberts occupied Kabul with a reign of terror, hanging Afghans before the city walls. The Afghans rose up again in 1880 at the Battle of Maiwan at Kandahar and killed 971 British and Indian troops. Britain established a new border between India and Afghanistan. A hundred years later, this border still causes trouble. In 1919, the pro-British Amir is assassinated by Islamic nationalists. The mountain tribes revolted using new guns manufactured by the English. The British then used a new weapon. Royal Air Force. Twenty pound bombs were dropped on Kabul and Jalalabad. The RAF continued to bomb the tribes of the northwest frontier until 1947. Clausewitz, the military thinker of the Napoleonic period, said that a campaign would fail without clear political and military aims. Are we in Afghanistan once again for democracy, women's rights, the defeat of Al Qaeda? opium control, or is it oil and gas? 